go. Episode 47 of the Hibs Ramble, and it's a very, very special edition of the Hibs Ramble this week. I'd like to welcome everyone to the first ever edition of the Hibs Ramble Season Awards, joined by Liam, Mark and Sean. Firstly, lads, Hello, it's a honor to be in your company for tonight's episode. So thank you very much. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. The hospitality so far has been great. Yeah. I've got a champagne glass filled with uh, filled with beer. Mark's got a martini glass filled with water. Uh, <laughs> so we obviously know <laughs> who the ramble prefers. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, um, I missed the memo about the tie. So sorry about that. I'm going to say missed the memo. I wasn't told until I came on that a tie was needed. Well, neither was Sean and neither was Mark. So, um, however, not minding the ties. Mark is currently sporting a Hibs Ramble bucket hat. It's actually a top hat. I'm sorry, a, a, a top hat because it's a bucket hat that he's curled up the way. Um, and it looks brilliant. Like he should be in a 60s slapstick comedy programme. I don't know. I think he looks like somebody at Bugsy Malone. He looks like he's going to Aye, the wee dip it one sell, me, sell, me, sell me false insurance <laughs> and blow my head off when I didn't pay him. Anyone ever seen Laurel and Hardy? No, what's that? Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean, you are wearing the Leith Seven inspired 1991 <laughs> Cup final team <clears throat> kit. You, you, has it even been in the wash yet? Have you even taken it off? I've still been sleeping in it. It's yeah. uh, starting to smell a little bit now, but I've also got the League Cup winners 1991 Hibs tie as well. Lovely touch. Lovely touch. Pre-orders are still open. Um, you need to get either your track top, your t-shirt or your bucket hat in time for the European trip to some outpost in the arse end of Northern Europe, no doubt. However, the Ramble will be fully represented and I'd like to take this chance to move on to our first award of this evening's ceremony. And the boys have been given a list of awards to prepare for. So it's kind of going to be a season review without being a full on season review because we're going to tie it in with awards. So the first award that we're going to give is a big one, probably the biggest honour a Hibernian could receive, which is like being recognised by a Rambler. And that is player of the season. So I'll go first. My player of the season is Kevin Nisbet. <coughs> Liam, who's yours? My player of the season is Josh Campbell. Mark? Mine's is Paul Hanlon. And Sean? <laughs> yeah, mine's is also Kevin Nisbet. So we're, we're strong on the Nizzy, Nizzy so far. Um, I'll give my reasons for this nomination and why I believe this nomination should stand. Um, I don't think we would have been anywhere near still in the hunt for third come the last few games of the season if it wasn't for Nisbet after he came back from injury. You could probably make a strong case for, <clears throat> you know, when usually you would think that players who become available or sign in January wouldn't really be in contention for a player of the year. But we've had quite a strong second half of the season with players like Fish coming into a game, CG, Egan Riley, <coughs> Jordan has been impressive since the turn of the year, which obviously culminated in him winning the, the actual secondary award of the Players Player of the Year, as voted for by his peers. But like we said, it's not about that. It's about the Ramblers. Um, but I, Nisbet's goal scoring, I think there was something about if he'd been fit for the entire season, he would have scored 30 over 38 games based on the way his stats went from his return from injury. So I, I think it's it's hard to look look past the goal scorer. I don't know if you kind of feel the same, Sean, which is why you went for Nisbet as well. Yeah, uh, that's pretty much the exact same reason. I w- I'd be concerned where we would have been if he either left in January or had an even longer injury. Um, I don't think we'd be anywhere near the position that we were in regardless of how good the like say Eli Yuan was in his absence and stuff. He was definitely dragged us to where we were. Yeah, no, it's, we, like I said, I don't think we'd be anywhere near where we are if it wasn't for the fact that Nisbet banged him in. Um, Liam, you went for Josh Campbell. Can you I can see why. I mean, he had a quite 
you know, had a strong first half of the season, certainly. He's kind of tailed off more towards the end. Um, but I don't think there's been a player who's had a bigger turnaround in a shorter space of time than Josh Campbell when you look at the way he was viewed by the support come, you know, this time last year, in the last season, he's had a big turnaround culminating in the fact that he got a new contract during the season as well. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I want to couple up with this boy because um, I think he has been... <laughs> 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 to be honest, I've, I've I've been waxing lyrical about Josh Campbell all season, and uh, I mean even if he had got you know three red cards in consecutive games at the towards the end of the season, he still would have been my player of the year. I think what what he's brought to the team this season has been obviously what Maloney and Ross has seen in training from him, and now he's at, and now he's doing it on the park. Uh, he's chipped in with goals, of course. Um, some of them very good goals. You know, you think about the one against Rangers, the one against Aberdeen, the header. I just think that he has had a brilliant, brilliant season. And I thought, I mean, I'm glad that he got at least young player of the season. But I think that uh, he probably could have been a, a real big shout to win player of the season. I know what you're saying about Kevin Nisbet getting the goals and like basically having us where we are now because of his input um, since he came back from injury. But I don't think you can understate the, the hard work that Josh has done in the midfield this season, and I think he's been brilliant. No, I don't disagree. I do think his form did tail off slightly towards the end. Um, it kind of coincided with uh, Doyle Hayes, and with Doyle Hayes especially being fit again because he wasn't fit for the sort of first part of the season. <clears throat> Okay, Maloney, Jack Ross tried to play him as a 10. Maloney tried to play him as a 6 when it's clear that his position is just to be sort of left alone in the centre of the midfield to go up and down. And we've seen that in his goals. I think he's returned double-figure goal goal involvements this season in terms of his goals and assists. So, no, a very credible nomination. And Mark, your nomination is one I'll probably split opinion amongst those <coughs> with low football and IQ. But those of us with high football and IQ um, can certainly understand why. But give us your reasons why, Paul Hanlon. I think you talk about a player that has defined a season. I think Paul Hanlon is one of those players. If you look at his partnership at the start of the season with Ryan Porteous, and Ryan Porteous came out and said that Paul Hanlon had a big influence on his career. Is is Ryan Porteous playing for Watford and playing as well as he did with Hibs without Paul Hanlon there, steadying the ship and holding that back line, I don't think so. Will Fish then came in after having a really difficult first half of the season, gets paired up with Paul Hanlon. They go on to form one of the strongest, in my opinion, one of the strongest uh, partnerships in the league, outside of the old firm, you could say. Um, again, does that happen with Rocky? Probably not. Does it happen with any other centre-half? Probably not. I think Paul Hanlon is the the ingredient in that in that recipe. And I would imagine that Will Fish, if he does end up going back to Man United, will say that Paul Hanlon had a big influence. I think if there was an award for most underrated player, it would probably go to Paul Hanlon, as usual, as he does every season. He goes through a period where a lot of Hibs fans give him a lot of stick. And that's because I think um, he's an easy target, as is Louis Stevenson. But for me, talk about consistency, solid performers that go pretty much... Uh, unthanked week in week out he puts in a brilliant performance and it's maybe Will Fish that's getting the plaudits or it's Joe Newell or it's Kevin Nisbet or it's Yuan but Hanlon quietly in the background is doing his job doing the simple thing and again if we don't have Paul Hanlon this season I don't think we're anywhere near where we're at I don't think Will Fish plays at the level he is I don't think Porteous plays at the level he was I think Hanlon's a man and he can pull out some Diag and all, Mark. Oh, the Diags. The Diags yeah. are up there as well. <clears throat> I'd, Mark, I completely agree. And I think that Paul's actually getting better with age, in my opinion. Um, he's, he, you know, he keeps, there's always this um, stigma over him about getting ragdolled by the big, bulky strikers. Um, I don't recall that happening too many times this season. You know, the amount of, more than one occasion. Someone like Mioski's went off, no had a sniff. Dukes went off, no had a sniff. Shankland in the last game never had a sniff. 
So I think, like you say, it's very easy for people to criticise Paul and go for Paul, especially when you remember at the start of the season, he was effectively stripped of the armband as well. This whole on-the-field captain but club captain role that he was given, it would have been very easy for Paul just to sort of down tools. And I think there was a period where he was on the bench at the start of the season um, and Johnson preferred Rocky and Porteous. And it's no coincidence, I feel, that Porteous's game improved when Hanlon was back in the team. Rocky's game improved immensely with Hanlon back in the team. And like you said, since January, him and Will Fisher have been integral at the heart of the defence and where we've ended up. So three three very strong candidates. Can we nail down? I know we've kind of gotten this bit too, too one one with the votes here, but I think everybody's made a strong argument for their for their nomination. I'm I'm still inclined to stick with Nisbet, however, <clears throat> if I was to go between it would be either Nisbet or Hanlon for me. I don't think Campbell's done enough compared to the other two. I think in terms of democracy it's really got to be Nisbet, isn't it? Yeah, really. It has to be. Well, so well done, Kevin. Well done, Kev. Our, the first ever Hibs Ramble Player of the Year award goes to Kevin Nisbet. And if rumours are to be believed, that'll be the one and only time he wins it. So Well, unless we become the Millwall Ramble next season. <laughs> <laughs> I don't fancy doing that. Um, Millwall. Right, our next award is for the goal of the season. Now, I didn't give the boys any context for this, so it could be a goal that actually meant something or it could be a goal that was just extremely aesthetically pleasing. Um, so to kick things off, my goal of the season is Eli Yuan's uh, first goal against Celtic. The left-footed volley from the edge of the box that looked like it was, from where I sat, looked like it was going out for a corner. And then it somehow just, it was almost like when you, remember that Roberto Baggio free kick game that you used to play in the PC? You put the curl on it and it just whipped, <coughs> just you know, uh, for me, that was just the most, um, the way he took it, and I think as well with the way the, the result ended up finally getting the result over um, Ange Postacoglu's Celtic, who'd sort of sweeped away all before them the last couple of years. Uh, it was, uh, I think that's the best the best goal that we scored this season. Liam, what about you? I've got the Nisbet free kick against Hearts. Um, I'm a sucker for a free kick, and yeah. especially one that's, that kind of goes against the grain of a usual free kick. <clears throat> um, it's a great finish. Goes obviously across the goalie. Gets the power on it to to beat Xander Clark. But it's the fact that when we needed him, our talisman, to step up and get us back into the game where we needed points. But, I mean, we needed a win, but we needed to get level on level terms first and foremost. He stepped up and he was the man to to put us back into that position. And I think that the whole season for him has probably culminated and led up to that point of scoring free kick at Tynecastle. And it was a brilliant, brilliant goal. Uh, I can't remember the last time I've seen him score a free kick. Uh, never mind. I was it going was. to say I can't remember the last time I've seen him score a free kick at Tynecastle. But I can remember the last time I've seen him score a free kick at Tynecastle. I actually uh, believe. Last free kick goal was Nisbet himself against Hamilton at Easter Road in the COVID season. No, I could be, been. I could be talking shy. I think he scored but, one against Stran Rar in the Scottish Cup that year as well, though, did he not? That was a heavily deflected. That's still comes so. But yeah, I'm going Nisbet free kick. <clears throat> it's a it's a kind of unorthodox way for the ball to go in, and I I really liked it. And then from where I was standing, it was. Really pleasing to watch. Yeah. What about you, Mark? What's your goal of the season? I have gone with Josh Campbell's goal against the Rangers at the start of the season. I think it's that perfect combination of it was an absolute beauty and it was very, very late in the game. I think maybe the last kick of the game and it was to get a point against Rangers. So it's got that perfect combination. The other thing, I mean, I absolutely love a good chest touch and that was an absolute beautiful chest touch. The fact that a lot of players would have tried to get it down with the chest, so try to batter it down onto the ground so that they can get a snapshot away. He's actually taken it to give it a wee bit of bounce, so it goes in there, gives it a little bit of spin, and then he's taken it on the volley. It, it wasn't the cleanest it shot, but that is what made it go into the side net. But that touch was absolutely unbelievable, and then he's finished it right into the top bin against Rangers last minute to get a point. 
the only way that could have been better if it was to get the three points. But that for me was just an absolute beauty. It was his left foot as well. No, no. Zinger. It seemed to take an absolute age to go in as well. <clears throat> like it just seemed to be kind of floating. I mean, you, when you actually watch it for that sort of replay for the south stand, it's like, why is McLaughlin not moved? Like, all he needs to do is jump to the side and he'll probably save it, but... I, I don't know, because it's going it's going away from him the whole time and it actually goes into the side net and I don't think he, he does get it if he dives for it. I, I just think it was a... a it, it did go in slow motion almost because it's... He could have easily just absolutely smashed that and it goes into the famous five-upper, but he's just, just put a wee delicate shot on it and like I said he's not hit it the cleanest but beauty yeah no I think when you add in the the caveats of who it was against when it came in etc it's a very very credible <clears throat> credible contender and Sean your goal of the season I went for Josh Campbell's uh, diving header against Aberdeen <clears throat> I believe that was the second goal as well um, for me I do, I do like a sweet volley. I do like a free kick as well. Um, and Eli Yuan's goal is a, a very, very well taken goal considering it's on his left. But for me to do a diving header like that from the edge of the box not only takes balls, but it takes a lot of technique to do as well. <clears throat> Obviously, it's a really good pick out from Joe Newell. Definitely worked on on the training ground and you can tell by the celebration from the bench at the time. And I think considering what was riding on that match, or apparently riding on that match, being El Sacco and, and all that nonsense, the fact that that took us into a 2-0 lead after about 15, 16 minutes just set the tone for the match. Um, and I like the fact not only did it then lead to him getting a hat-trick, but we never really stopped that match either. So it wasn't like one of these games where you go 2 or 3 nil up and then the game's dead. You know, We scored in like the 90th minute as well. We scored a couple late on. And the actual, I just feel like the start that we had to that match was just one of the most dominating performances I've seen at Easter Road. And you don't often see a well-taken diving header, ever. Never mind from the edge of the box. So for me, that's that's that was clear. Tell you what, we've got four very strong... We have got four zingers, haven't we? nominations. Um... I've listened to your arguments. I support your arguments. Um, as much as I enjoyed Yuan's goal, I, I do think I would lean slightly more towards Nisbet's at Tynecastle, um, purely because of who's it, who it's against and where it was as well. I think if that goal's at Easter Road, it's not celebrated that much, but because of where it was and then he's... His celebration, given at the old Ronaldo, sh- calm down. Um, I don't know about you boys, but I, I would be happy to to lend my weight behind Kevin Nisbet's free kick at Tyne Castle. It's either that or the George Campbell volley for me. Yeah, I, I would. Out, out the four, I would actually have Nisbet's at the bottom of the four. Of course. Well, you and second, and then Josh Campbell's, uh, as in the the volley. Um, I think the most difficult one's definitely Eli Yuan's. Eli Yuan's mm-hmm. the, the most difficult shot to take. It's going yeah. away from him. Like that, he's on the turn now. Box, like that, that is unbelievably difficult to do. And how he's managed to find the bottom corner, I've no idea. But taking everything into account, I'm going to stick by Josh Campbell's. <laughs> I do. I don't disagree with you, Sean. No, I think Campbell's header does take. And that's one of those ones where, so like Ellie Ewan's when he just needs to hit it right. With um, Campbell's volley, again, I think with the amount of space and time that he's got any connection on, on goal is probably likely a goal. Nisbet's free kick, in theory, the keeper shouldn't be getting beat for there because it's on his side. There was no way that Nisbet was going to get the ball up and down over the wall. With Josh Campbell's header, that needs to be perfect from everything. It has to be the perfect ball in, the perfect run for Campbell, the perfect header, trajectory, power on it. Yeah. Everything. So it's I do I do think it is a difficult one. Um do you know what? If we can't put a name to the award, we can put this one out to the to the listeners. We can but I think I think we can give it I think we can give it to, to somebody. 
I well, think out of, out of all of us, if in instances where we can't come to agreement, we should decide out of the four whatever second favourite would be, and then if we've got a leaning agreement there. So, for example, my second favourite would be Ellie Yuan's. So if anyone else's second favourite would be Ellie Yuan's, then you could potentially lean to that then being... Well, I think my second favourite is Campbell at Easter Road against Rangers. And Craig, your second favourite will be the heater. No, Nisbet, I've already said Nisbet's free kick. And Marks, will be the, Marks will be the heater against well, that. That's that shot of the one, then, then, but like I said, if we had to, if we had to pick one, I think. Do you know what? I'll, seeing as I'm the host, I'll pull rank on this one, and because of when it was, who it was against, it sort of continued that good feeling at the start of the season. We'll go with Josh Campbell's volley against Rangers. Well done, Josh. So well done, Josh. Well done, Mark. Well, we we will put it out to the Ramblers as well. Or Sean will put it out to the Ramblers and. You can tell us uh, who your goal of the season was out of those four. Yeah, I do think it's, <clears throat> especially when you consider the season that Josh had before, um, it was nice for him to have that moment. So, well done, Josh. You just narrowly missed out on our player of the year, but you have won our goal of the year. Now, the next one, next award is moment of the season. Now, this could be anything. It can be a goal, it can be a win, it can be a moment during a game, it can be absolutely anything. So, seeing as I've started each time, Sean, I'll come to you first. What is your singular moment of the season? Mine's was the second half performance against Celtic towards the back end of the season where we won. Um, I think we obviously went into that game with a lot riding on it, needing something from it. Um, I like the fact that Lee Johnson went for it in the second half and kind of was able to read the game a little bit better. I didn't actually, I don't think anyone at Easter Road could have expected us to come out of the traps in the second half the way that we did. Yes, it's helped by Scott Bain having an absolute nightmare, Celtic not starting the game at full strength and not having anything to play for, but that takes nothing away from our second half performance. And some of the goals, some of the football played in that second half is some of the best football I've seen at Easter Road. And that second half performance for me is better than the whole 90 minutes against Aberdeen, just because of some of the football that we played. Strong, strong. Mark, what's yours? So, first of all, can I just say I'm not going to talk about the last derby of the season because it just hurts a little bit too much, so I just can't. I just can't associate any awards with that. Otherwise, I probably would have saved Kevin Nisbet's free kick. So I'm going to go with Martin Boyle's equaliser against Hearts at the start of the season. Um, I can't remember a time where I've celebrated a goal that much at home. I can't remember a time where Easter Road has been that bouncing, that electric, just unbelievable 95th minute to get an equaliser when... It just looked like we were dead and buried. It was just absolutely incredible. On top of that, Martin Boyle wasn't even meant to be there. He had just signed, I think, the night before. And we were told the morning of, it was actually Ben Kensel came up to us in the Albion and said, oh, by the way, he's in the squad. And then all of a sudden, there's this buzz going about the place that he's in the squad. Then he comes on the pitch and does that. It was just a ridiculous moment and um, absolute limbs. So I'm going with that. Strong, very strong, and you'll see why I say very strong when I get to my moment. Liam, what's yours? Uh, I've got to agree. I think the whole vibe around the Martin Boyle return was uh, impeccable. Um, you know, from Al Faisley uh, leaking it <laughs> and making it so that Hibs couldn't have a half decent announcement uh, planned, um, you know, to the point where in the second half of that game, we thought. We could really use Martin Boyle here, and he comes on and he's no played football in what two or three months or something, and he's he pulls out a half decent performance and then scores right at the very end. It was written in the stars. Um, I think if you could have written a script before the game kicked off, I mean, obviously without Hearts scoring, you would have said the Martin Boyle last minute winner uh, after eating macaroni and chips for his tea the night before. Um, but yeah, I think. I think for me, definitely the, the Martin Boyle return. 
Well, I think it's going to be a clean sweep because my moment of the season also is not <clears throat> I'm coming on, not scoring, but just finding out that he was signed again. Mm-hmm. That kind of rumour broke on the Friday night and it was like, a, nah, surely no, surely no. And I think when you get to being an adult, right, you, <clears throat> you do get excited for games, but it's not like a giddy excitement. It's more of a, like the derby, like... The, the excitement during that was the fact then, that, we, that we all were together, we went in the march and all that, and we had a laugh for the morning up until we got into the game. But that boil announcement <clears throat> proper took me back to being a kid and being absolutely buzzing to get to a Hibs game. That feeling of when when that uh, Alpha Sally put the tweet out and we're like that, nah, nah, <laughs> surely. Like, I thought it was a fake account. Everybody's clicking on it and translating the tweet and, and everything. And then next, um, when the when it's for me, it's when the team sheet comes out and you see that Boyle's on the bench. Um, I just think that, like Mark says, the buzz. <clears throat> obviously, when when you guys were in the Albion, the, the buzz it would have created there. But it was like everybody on their way to the game or already at the game before the players came out found out at the same time, and it just raised that sort of level to where, are. Like you say, Mark, if the limbs, I don't think those limbs happen if Yuan scored or Newell scored or Hanlon scored or Porches scored or whatever. It was because it was Boyle and the way it all transpired. So I think this is... I think the other, good... the other thing as well is, I think what we need to remember is it was right at the start of the season. So if that had maybe been in January or like right at the end of the season, it probably wouldn't have meant as much. But you know what it's like at the start of the season, you're full of hope, you're full of dreams. I think that was only the second game of the season and we had beat St. Johnson. I think we had scored like the ninety in the 95th minute or whatever to beat them 1-0. I kind of mind of hearts for the second game after that, but you're still full of hope and expectation. And then all of a sudden you score in the 95th minute against Hearts to equalise. You've got Martin Boyle. After that game, that full stadium is thinking this is going to be a good stadi- a good uh, year, sorry, a good season. And I yeah. just think that that hope, that that expectation is what else. hope that kills you. It is, I, because it turned out to be fish, but it was a brilliant time to be absent. So are we unanimous in our. I think, I think we have to be. Yeah, to be fair, I, when I saw what we were meant to be picking and I saw a moment of the season, I, I would have. Picked that. Oh, yeah. Just for you had to be of it being an award show and give us something else to talk about as well. But I completely agree with everyone that uses it. I'll take back. I was about to compliment Mark there, but he's a fucking wank. <laughs> <laughs> um, nah, to echo what Mark said, I've, I can't remember the last time there was a buzz about that and, and limbs like that at Easter Road. Um, even the cheer he got when he came out just before the game started, like it was celebrated like it was a 90th minute winner. I don't know if you remember, but that was like when Ryden came back for Celtic. That's what that felt like. Yeah. I, the, I, I vaguely remember that, but I feel like this was just on a whole other It was I think that level. was a, a massive, like massive level. Compared so to the get to sign in a real superstar. I know he's not a superstar, but in our eyes he is. He's an, like it, yeah. it's the closest we'll get to a Ronaldo returning to Man United. Do you know what I mean? That, that, that's the closest we'll get to something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope you listen to this. I thought you had the worst take locked in, but no, you know what I mean, like when Ronaldo turned to, it's like a home, a homecoming for a hero. Yeah. That's what it was like. I understand that. Uh, but on the same level as Ronaldo, obviously. <laughs> no, his boils better. <laughs> so are we unanimous in our choosing that the moment of the season is Boyle's return? Yeah. 100%. Congratulations, Martin. Congratulations, Martin. Well done on moment of the season. I know you'll be listening. The moment of next season could very well be the photo oh, that he put on Instagram yeah. earlier with his boots on, showing that he's he Bad. likes for next season is ready to ramble. After he scores uh, 52 goals in all comps. <laughs> Love it. Right, next up is away day of the season. Now, there's quite a, f- a few strong, strong contenders in this. Um, Mark, what is your away day of the season so I was actually torn about this one I'm, I'm going to change my answer to what I put in the group chat I'm going to change it from St Mirren the one where Yuan got the winner I'm going to change it to St Johnson opening day of the season 
the only reason I'm doing so is because of the day in general for me was better. I drove, this is a personal thing, I drove to St Mirren, so I only seen the game and then drove back. But it was amazing. Whereas St Johnson, first game of the season, sun was out, we were in a beer garden before it. It was absolutely brilliant. The pints were, were flowing. And then uh, <laughs> we've got the, the, the 94th minute winner or whatever it was. And I think, again, what I talked about when we scored the equaliser, it was the first game of the season, so you're absolutely full of hope. And when you score a late winner and you're opening game, it's not very often you do that as Hibs fans. So we were all on the bus saying, this is it. We're finally going to do it. We're going to win the league. Like This, <laughs> this is going to be it. So I think for that reason, I'm going to change my answer to St. Johnson away, opening day of the season. Strong. Liam, what's yours? You need to stop putting me after Mark because it just sounds like I'm copying him all the time. But St Johnson <laughs> away is mine as well. Uh, for every single reason that Mark said, me and Mark went to the game together. Uh, pints were flowing. It was a beautiful sunny day. Um, I'm, I think uh, I had my top off at one point. Um, not not that anyone wants to see that. I mean, people have paid to go and watch football and they've ended up looking at my tits. I mean, it's, no, it's not very fair on anyone. Did you have your top off? I think That's I did, aye. I, I think I did. I'm sure right. I did. Because uh, it was roasting, uh, and then obviously ninety fourth minute winner, and it was complete limbs. Uh, and you know my old man and Paddy, who we go to the games with, uh, were were nearly killed uh, in in the aftermath um, in the aftermath of the goal. But it was it would have been completely worth it if they if they had to died, um, <laughs> because we got the three points. And I always like getting one up against St Johnson because I fucking hate them. Yeah. It's a strong shout, very strong shout. Um, Sean, what about you? You're away day of the season. Speaking of getting getting it up on a team, I chose Livy away. Notoriously a terrible place to go. We don't often play well there, um, but the performance that we put in not long after the pass in Iran, um, some of the football we played again and some of the goals that we scored were just really, really good. We were obviously in the corner beside Block 7, who were creating a brilliant atmosphere. Um, we were in the wee shitty behind the goals bar, behind the whatever tunnel bar, whatever it's called that Livy have got, uh, me, Mark and Liam. So it was a good good day pre-match as well. Um, and then the game itself was really, really good. And it was the birth of a magical dance as well. <laughs> um, so everything, for me, everything about it was really, really good. Um, not necessarily just on the park, but off the park as well. So that's that's my one. Yeah, mine's... <clears throat> I went for yours, Mark, your first choice. I went for St Mirren away. We didn't have many uh, to pick from, Craig, did you? No, I've been to a few, mate, so fucking wrap your pick. <laughs> it was either St Mirren or St Johnston, or that was that. <laughs> or Celtic. That's it. Cut the podcast. Cut the podcast. That can't be it. Is that it? I think so. Did you not go to Motherwell, Craig? Oh, Kelly? Is <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Listen, when you're, when you're the host of such a successful podcast, going to things like mean, little meaningless away games doesn't really concern you when you're trying to keep their ship intact. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So no, mine was mine was St Mirren away. I think the St Mirren away was the day after that we'd found out that Ron had actually passed. Because I seem to remember there was folk singing about. Oh no, this is when we'd found out that he was unwell. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah. was the, this is when he put that statement out saying about how unwell he was and that he'd had um, that he was rece- receiving treatment for his cancer. And it was one of the first away games that in a while that me and Alfie have went to um like just the two of us like we trained it through we got a certain team before it trained it through got to the game and that <clears throat> and Is that the game where you missed the train and had to get another one or was that another away game no i would oh, i remember it. i remember the that the trains were the train was cancelled so we were wanting i was trying to get the obviously the one that goes through to glasgow that only stops at like pullman and fog yep. kai where I ended up getting the fucking bopter that goes through like Coat Bridge and Airdrie and fucking arse end of everywhere. Um, I mean, we still made it to the game in, in decent time, obviously let down by an absolute shambles of a pie that day that still makes me violently sick every time I think about it. Um, but no, it was just, it was one of those proper, 
sort of winter away days, three o'clock, floodlights are on from kickoff. Um, that was the birth of the early Yuan. No, it wasn't. Yeah, it was. No, it wasn't. It, it was at home against Aberdeen. No, St. Mirren away was the first time he'd done it. Incorrect. <laughs> Is that incorrect? His it first was. goal. It was his first goal, and that was at home against Aberdeen. 29th of January, we played Aberdeen at home where he scored, and then the 4th of February, we played St. Mirren away where he scored. And that's me right again. <laughs> and that's me right again. Oh, I'm a host of this podcast. I need to keep the shit on so, him. He doesn't even get his fucking facts. See how, <laughs> see how defensive he gets, though. See how defensive he gets. It's unbelievable. Who was right and who was wrong? Reeled in. Reeled in. Aye. Listen, Danny, Danny you come for me with nonsense like that. Your weekend at the Monday before coming for you has been absolutely abysmal and it is now living <laughs> in your head rent free. <laughs> um, so, I, for, for me, the LU and <clears throat> goal to get us a 1-0 win in, in Paisley was a choice, but I don't think there's going to be too much arguments if we go for St, uh, St. Johnston first game away. Well, we need to hear Sean's first. Oh, no, no, he's just not listening when that's speaking. No, I didn't. I, I usually just tune out when you talk, Sean, I'm not going to lie. I'm sorry, uh, I've been very nasty to everyone in this podcast. That, that, beer, that one beer you've had. End of year awards. You need to that one glass of champagne. Man. I believe, do you know what as well, I think because the St Johnston game was the birth of the Rambo as well, we've done our first, I'm sure we've done our first episode after that game. Um, yeah, our first game review anyway. Yeah, first ep- first game of the season, I think. Any arguments for you, Sean, if we go for St Johnston no, away? It was, it was, I wasn't at the game, but I was watching it, good limbs, looked at a good day, I was very jealous that I wasn't there. Well done, St Johnston away. Well done, St Johnston away. Now, this is going to be a resounding award because we can't really recall any other ones off the top of our head. <laughs> are we just going to let him lead in with an apology and his reasoning behind it? Or? So this, 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 this award goes for worst take of the season and we're not going to take any nominations. We're not going to take anything else. Um, and it shows you how bad it is that it's the only one that stands out over the course of the season and Mark would you like to lead in with what is the worst take of the season please I'll just go right to it Dundee United I predicted <laughs> them to finish in the top six of the there season there was a 100% guarantee Mark remember Listen, I'll flip it if you need to <laughs> I am not the only one to think that Dundee United have a strong squad <laughs> they had hit a small bit of form at that period and I thought they definitely have enough to climb the table. And I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong and I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's the end of that. Next category. Can I just have an honourable mention for worst take of the season? <sighs> and that's anyone that has said that Jimmy Jago isn't a good player. <laughs> just, uh, just, just on Mark's terrible take, I remember... The episode, I, 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 I like bringing it up, Mark. I'm not gonna, I'm not even going to beat around the bush. I like bringing it up. I remember you saying on that episode as well that I think was it Liam Fox that was in charge or something at the time. This was a true start. <laughs> oh, and he was gone Liam all the Fox, the since, since Liam Fox had taken charge, Mark said that he they had the best defensive record. I don't even know if it was out with the old firm or if it was just in um, general. He'd only been in charge for like two games or something. So, uh, exactly. Two not one the ones or something. For the scores. Now no, obviously it was, it was as has already like been alluded games to games myself and Sean have not record. had a bye. It was true. At every ground this season. Instagram. <laughs> um, in fact, I've probably had about three or four times so well done, Mark. of away. So Liam has <laughs> tallied the average scores. <laughs> From Most most likely having locked in because they've had, I think, if they find the league this season. But anyway, I accept. Um, So, Liam, I'll let you take it away. Who has won the first ever Rambo Pioneer Show? It's an award. It's an award. Right, well, I'll go in reverse order. You've got to be happy to chime in with uh, your thoughts on the prize or if you think it's a fair score or not um, as a goal. Right, next, we will go for um, probably. I just want to say there have been some stinkers. This and it's set really really Liam apart from day dot. But there's been some really, really and good that is And the average season. score um, that has been added Which to the best in the Paris. Which pie is 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 the best in the Paris. Which pie is
across the season. So middle of the road, no one's really getting a big advantage here. So <clears throat> bottom of the table, St Mirren, 30 Fucking points. yes. Fucking get it up, you. That steak and black pudding pie was fucking rotten. It was rancid. Rancid pie. Mark, do you remember the pie at all? I do. It was disgusting. I've had two pies at St Mirren last season across two separate games. Both crap. Sean, did you have a St Mirren pie? Not this season. In previous seasons, I've had one and they've been poor. So I'm not surprised. Sort it out, St Mirren. Absolutely yeah. shocking. And they're, they're bottom by like a long, long shot as well. Because I think my score for them was like a five as well. Yeah, it was. It was like minimum. I think it was four, actually. Terrible. I think you gave them bare minimum. Uh, Celtic and Dundee United are next with uh, on joint 39 points. I remember the Celtic pie being all right. Nothing to write home about. Uh, and the Dundee United one was absolutely rancid. Absolutely yeah, rancid. I remember Dundee United normally having a decent pie, so I'm quite surprised. It was a midweek, though. When, when I got my one, it was a midweek. And it was... It just... It screamed of a pie that was cooked yesterday and been sat on a hot plate for 24 hours. Quite a surprise. I thought the Dundee United pie would get in the top six. <laughs> <laughs> The Celtic pie, I thought, was all right, but it was the weird pricing that kind of knocked it down for me. Uh, the Celtic think... pie, when we got beat 6-1, and it was vile. Absolutely vile. Yeah. I think what, what's uh, brought Celtic score up is your one, Craig. Because yeah. I think you gave it a half-decent score, but me and Mark, I don't think me and Mark... Do they were... still do the Domino's pizzas at Celtic Park? I don't think so. I didn't see them anyway. I didn't see them. Uh, next up is St Johnston, 43 points. Now, my pie at St Johnston at the start of the season, I feel like I, I ranked it pretty harshly compared to the rest of the pies that I've had over the season. I think I probably could have given it a wee bit more credit. Uh, I think, Johnston, did, we not, did we not miss the the special pie? We missed the special pie. Yeah. We did. Was like I was in put, too late to get the special pie. <clears throat> And I've had a lot of good pies at St Johnston. I really have. Don't get me wrong, honestly. But this pie, I didn't think was great. On reflection, I think it was better than I ranked it. So that is on me, and I'm going to take that into next season and make an improvement on my judgment. Um, I don't know what you thought about the St Johnston pies, Mark. I actually don't think I had a pie at St Johnston, to be honest. Oh, because this was this was when you were pre-ramble as well. I think I was too bevied, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, this was pre premiership for, for Mark and Sean, so we can kind of let them pass. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, seventh, or next up, because there's a couple of teams that are on even points here. So Aberdeen are next up, 45 points. And we're starting to get to the, the pies that were moving away from absolutely rank to you know barely edible. The one Aberdeen pie was a bit dry for me, but it was all yeah. right. When I went up to Aberdeen, it was a Friday night. I think it's the same the same sort of thing as Dundee United. I think it was cooked probably the day before and reheated. Mark says it was dry. I thought it was dry. Wasn't it great? But then, again, me and you were absolutely bevied, Mark. So, <laughs> I mean, our judgment probably could have been miles off. Uh, I know neither of you have had an Aberdeen pie this season, so I will neglect to get you to comment on this. I just my, my score would be knocked down for Aberdeen's pies anyway because they still I'm assuming they still serve them to you from behind the fucking cage. Yeah. 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 That's true. Uh, next up, middle of the road, Hibs, forty six points. Now the pie that we've had the most over the course of the season. I've been a strong, strong advocate for the chicken curry pie at Hibs this season because it is tremendous. But here at the Hibs Ramble, we don't judge chicken curry pies. We don't judge macaroni pies. We're here for steak pies only. The steak pies only were okay only. Craig, you've been on a rant about six or seven times over the course of the season yep. about these pies at Easter Road. I'll not come to you to comment again um, because, frankly, I've heard it far too many times. I Mark will just, Sean, though, just wait, I will say that I do believe the best pie I've had this season was Easter Road. 
and that was yeah. the uh, under 19s game that me and Sean went to. But there's been far too many substandard shite pies for it to get a higher score than what it is. I think it's fine. I think it's fine for where it is. Yeah. I think it absolutely deserves to be slap bang in the middle of the table. It's all right. You can eat it. It's not going to blow you away. It's not going to disappoint you. It's fine. It is fine. It's just fine. Sean? <laughs> I, I'm leaning more to agree with Craig, but that's only because of how good the pies were when I was at the European Games, like the under 19s European Games, like they were that good that when I then went on the Saturday, it made those ones rank. Yeah. What do you think the problem is? What do we need to fix in the summer? Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Pippin Hibbs by one point is our city neighbours' hearts. Now I remember, I didn't get a pie the last time we were at hearts, the 1 1 game. But I do remember one of the times I've been at Ten Castle this season, I got a pie and I thought it was actually pretty good. Yeah. I really I thought, did think it was pretty good. I'm sure I enjoyed it. the pie quite highly. Sean, what did you think? The one I had the weekend or so ago, a couple of weekends ago, was pretty decent. It was verging on probably very good. The only thing that let it down was that it was a bit burnt. Um, apart from that, it was had perfect liftage and tasted well. I won't get into the insides of the pie. I think, on the face of it, you're looking at a half-decent pie there at Tide Castle. I mean, if you had them at Easter Road every week, you'd be chuffed. You know what I mean? Yep. Simple as. Next up, <coughs> just missing out on the the podium, shockingly maybe to some, is Kilmarnock with a score of 48. Now, hotly tipped as the best pies in Scottish football for decades. I don't know. Do you think there's you... an expectation that it should be that good and there that is an expectation you're then harsher with, with it? Because I, I, yeah. I feel that's maybe played a part in it. The one I had at Kelly was, was good, but it wasn't to the standard I would expect a Kelly pie to be at. And that's probably... Yeah, my problem, my problem is I buy the Kelly pies too often now at Aldi's. So I like Liam's oven Kelly pies. And it was a freezing cold day as well when we went to Kilmarnock. I do, do not, I do not remember a single thing about Hibs playing Kilmarnock away this season. Like, not a single thing. It was the Melkerson was offside Melker. when he was uh, offside. Yeah. We will beat one nil. McCurdy had a chance as well. It was an f- awful game. Awful game. It was horrible and it was freezing cold and I'm I'm glad for you that you weren't there, Craig. It's the only ground that I've not watched anyway. Yeah, since Premiership that I never visited this season. It was Rugby Park. Don't know why. Sorry. I think you had things on. Yeah, I did. I did. But I'm going to need to visit it next season. I even yeah. missed... I actually never seen us play Kilmarnock this season because I even missed the home game. Don't know why. I just always seem to have something on when we play Kilmarnock. So I'm really sorry. United, <laughs> United, yeah, I'm really sorry, Derek McInnes. I'm really sorry, McInnes. <laughs> but yeah, missing out on the podium. And to be honest, you've got to up your game next season, Kelly, if you want to get into those. I mean, European pie spots. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not good enough, basically. But now we're moving into the cream of the crop. We're into the top three slash top four because there's a joint in here as well. Coming in with a bronze medal is Rangers. Now, Rangers, I don't like Rangers fans. I don't like Rangers football club. But I like Rangers pies. The pie was superb. Uh, the Kevin Nisbet gig, it was a great, it was. great pie. A great pie. <coughs> and and it, was the, it was freezing cold outside. Exactly. And it, it was the exact too... opposite of Kilmarnock. Because Kilmarnock was far too cold. The pie was far too hot. But as Rangers, it was far too cold. The pie was hot enough to warm you up, but no too hot that it'll burn your mouth. I think as well my opinion was maybe a little bit off because I was absolutely ravenous. I was Mm. so hungry that I actually got two pies and devoured both of them. And both of them were magnificent. They were great. They were great pies. Absolutely no doubt about it. Great, great pies. 
And yeah. I don't think I've actually had anything other than a good pie at Ibrox. Yeah, going in the past, I think Ibrox typically does provide a good pie. I mean, you look at the, they've got, you know, the first or second highest budget in the league. They should be providing good pies, good match yeah. days, Grant. I don't think there's an excuse to not have good pies. Just goes to show, though, considering who's top, that you don't necessarily need a big budget to provide a good well, pie. Well, don't spoil anything, Sean. I was trying to give you a segue there, Leon. Well, we're going into the silver medal anyway. The silver medal is going to be halved between Motherwell and Livingston. 52 points, Pippin Rangers by a solitary point. Now, I don't remember an awful lot about the Motherwell pie. It was all right. I remember it was good. I remember it being all right. I remember it being good. I think what, I think, oh, you were at Motherwell as well, Craig, were you not? No, no, no. Oh, were you not? No. I think me and you, Mark, have rated the Motherwell pie pretty highly. I think it's quite similar to Hibs. It's all right. It's not, it didn't blow me away. It didn't disappoint me. It was what a look for in a steak pie. It was definitely a pie. Yep. That's for sure. That's for damn sure. 100% (laughs) Hundred <laughs> percent, definitely a pie. Livingston, on the other hand, of they're a dark horse, an absolute dark horse. They have sneaked their way into the European spots here, and the European spots here. You know, it's <laughs> the pie that I had at Livy at the opening day, not the opening day, but the first game at Livingston was rank rotten, and that was the one that I rated. Whereas the one that use free rated was the one at the four one game. And I had yep. a pie then as well. And it was tremendous. So it's good to see that a poor score for me at the start of the season hasn't brought Livy's score down and they have listened to our comments. Because we know that David Martindale is obviously an avid listener of the Hibs Ramble. I mean who isn't sure. these days? But that leaves the top spot to the best pie in the cinch premiership this season and for me for one I'm delighted that they will be staying in the premiership it's Ross County can we have a round of applause for Ross County I just want to say a few words about this if I may yep the floor's yours the pie at Ross County is like something I've never had before in my life I had three in the one game. I, I went up midweek, absolutely pissing my brain, snowing, miserable. I probably couldn't get any lower. And then I went and approached the cashier and asked for two steak pies. And he kindly handed me them over plus change. <laughs> and I honestly, it was it was an orgasmic moment of the mouth. Is this was, the game where you almost died on the way up? Yes, because yeah. Paddy was on his phone. <laughs> And, and then pie. David Marshall was assaulted as well. It, it was sure just an unbelievable, speak. an unbelievable pie. So I'd like to thank you. Did we not Boston. do a speech that night as well? Yes. No, we did. Oh, did we? That. Yeah. Yeah, because Mark was, was trying to join day, it. Isn't? Mark was trying to join it on his way back, but he couldn't because, like he said, he was in fear for his life at flying down <laughs> the pitch black roads in the pushing rain and the howling wind at like 100 mile an hour. <laughs> like, Are they playing the PlayStation at the wheel? Was that the night we signed Matthew Hoppe as well? Yes, it was. It was the night where the McPlant was born and shared. Oh, unreal. Unreal story. But yeah, Ross County, wonderful pie. I had three in the one game. An incredible pie. Mal- it really was. Malky Mackay, we don't like you. We don't Malky like you. Malky Mackay. However, Ross County, the first champions of the Hibs Ramble Premiership table. Well done, Roy McGregor. Well done, the Staggies. Well done, Noah and Kenna. You deserve it. And Simon Murray. Yeah, and Simon Murray, yeah. Let's not and forget. I think and we Russell should get a free pie. Those. And Keith Watson. And I think we should get a free pie when we go up there next season. Just one each, because we rated them so highly and we gave them this prestigious award. And we can take their trophy up to them, of course, as well. Yeah, one of you can have mine because what's the chances of me going to Ross County the next season? I'll tell you right now, absolutely zero. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll print off like a wee 2023 Hibs Ramble Pioneership winners and stick it on their wee kiosk. 
Have it. Right, next. That's us. So well done, Ross County, for the first inaugural winners of the <clears throat> Hibs Pie We're going to have to change for next season. I don't think we can just get away with doing steak pies anymore because it'll get stale, like half the pies in the league. Um, so we'll need to come up with a formula, whether it be just anything off the menu or a certain pie or a certain, I don't know, but the Premiership will live on, but we'll 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 change it up. We'll switch it up for next season. Um, next is signing of the season. So Liam, we'll come to you first with this one. Your signing of the season and your reasons for the signing of the season. I could have gone to two or three for me for this one, but I think for the impact that he's had um, and shoring up the defence since he. You know, had a, a bit of a woeful debut uh, at right back at Tynecastle. I've got to go with Will Fish. I think he's been brilliant this season for someone who's had so little first team experience to, you know, pull a second half of the season out of the bag like he has and perform as well as he has. I think is testament to him. And for me, yeah, Will Fish signing the season. Sean, I went for Eli Yuan. Um, I was actually <clears throat> quietly, I didn't try and say it that loudly, but I was quietly impressed with him even at the start of the season. Um, we're all about high football and IQ on this podcast and those with high football and IQ would have been able to identify and see the strengths that he was bringing to that hip side even when he wasn't bringing goals. Um, he is very, very frustrating, but his contribution this season has, has been brilliant. Considering his age, his background, it's difficult to come into the Scottish game and and just play as well as he has. Um, and when he was asked to lead the line, he done very very well as well. Um, and I probably wouldn't have picked him if we hadn't signed him permanently. Um, with him obviously being alone, but I think he's had that good an impact that we've been able to obviously pull the trigger and, and sign him permanently. And um, hopefully many years to many years to come. I agree, Sean. That's why my player at that may sorry, my sign of the season is also Eli Yuan. Um I do agree that he is very frustrating. I think I voice that more than most others do on a, any given match day. However, being a Hibs fan, when you think about it as we've grown up, the players that we tend to gravitate to are the ones that get you off your seat. Boyle, Griffiths, Cummins, Latape, going back years, <clears throat> O'Connor, players like that. And Ewan's a player who can get you off your seat. Um, and like said, he's, he's been sort of tasked with leading the line. You know, he's he's had the misfortune, you could call it, uh, being in the same squad as two of the best attackers in the league and not playing alongside both of them at the same time. You know, it's been him and Boyle, then him and Nisbet. Um, you know, it's it'll be one of those ones that we look back on if all three had been fit. Where could we have ended up? Because we've seen it that season with, with Dodge, Nisbet and, and Boyle. You know, the amount of goals they scored for us. Um, so I, I agree, Sean. He's, <clears throat> he's a very exciting player. I believe that after watching the Burton Albion friendly, I made a professionally professional image on Photoshop with Ellie Yuan's head at the head of the ship uh, with HMS Pistol League up the side. <laughs> um, so I have been an Ellie Yuan convert from the very beginning. And I just think in a season that's been blighted by so many ups and downs, he's been the, the shining light throughout the course of the season. Um, especially when you look at the a game like the Livingston game at home where Nicky De- he's up against Nicky Devlin, who's one of the more consistent, sort of almost Louis Stevenson-esque players in the league where you know you'll get seven out of ten out of them every week. Livingston captain to the point where Martin Dale hauled him off because Ewan absolutely ripped his arsehole inside out. So, yeah, Ellie Ewan for me. Mark, would you like to round off the signing of the season nominations? Yeah, mine's is Eli Yuan. That's all I've got. <laughs> well, well done, Eli. 
I think you absolutely captured you, Craig, you, John. Absolutely, I couldn't possibly add to that, to be honest. I agree with absolutely everything you said. In particular, at the start of the season, he wasn't getting his goal. It took a while to break that duck, but he was still getting a lot of assists, still contributing a lot to the team. He even went through that little dip where he was actually getting benched quite a lot and it showed the character to bounce back, break back into the first team and then go and have that um, ascendancy in which he's had and then quickly become a fan favourite and get, get signed. It's been a pleasure to watch. Yep. Couldn't agree Brilliant. more. So well done, Ellie. You are the first ever Hibs Ramble signing of the season. Now, these ones aren't so much awards because it's more trying to... We, we don't want to be too negative, but it'd be remiss of us not to um, to mention them. Um, your worst signings of the season. So I'll kick it off by saying mine's is... <clears throat> so this is in no way a reflection on them as individuals. Let's just make that crystal clear. Because um, I think we've seen... Somebody quote tweeted us saying something about mental health and then advocating for poor signings of the season or something like that. We're allowed to have opinions on players <clears throat> and their impact without sort of digging out them as, as people. So let's just make that abundantly clear. My worst signing of the season is Harry McCurdy. Um, it pains me to say it. Um, it pains Liam to hear it because every week at home, as Harry has ran past him to warm up, Liam has stood up. And I've seen I him. I've seen Liam do his celebration more than I've ever seen Harry do his own celebration. And Even I just think all the goals that he scored last season. Yep. The hype that it was when he came in, you know, it was a, when you think back to the summer transfer window, deadline day, um, people were wanting Ben and Ian's heads on spikes if we didn't sign him. Um and now it's been a combination of many things of form, fitness, injury, <clears throat> probably his own confidence. But I think for the hype and the outlay compared to the return, we've not had anywhere near enough as what we'd expect from someone who arrived with the fanfare that, that Harry McCurdy did. So Harry McCurdy, for me, is our worst signing of the season. And again, just like to make it crystal clear, it's not a reflection on Harry as a person. So, oh, Mark, who's your... I uh, have gone with Aidan McGeady. Um, and the reason I've gone with Aidan McGeady is because I think he came with very much a big name. You know, he's he's done a lot in football. I think everyone knew that he was, what, 36 when he, when he came up, but he's still carried quite a lot of expectation given that he had played at the highest level, he'd won a lot of trophies and everyone and he'd also played at a high level at Sunderland despite being a, a fair age and I think it's just been really disappointing that and I know obviously it's you know there's nothing you can do as a, a professional footballer, particularly at that age, when you get injured. Um the one thing that's making me pick uh, McGeady over McCurdy is that at least McCurdy you can say what you want about him, but at least he's been available. At least he's been there for the vast majority of the season. Whereas Aidan McGeady, barring what, maybe a month, two months of the season, he has been injured. Um, I think when we started the season, he played the majority of games in the Premier Sports Cup and he was poor, to say the least. He missed a penalty against uh, Bonnie Rick Rose or whatever it was. Um, and he was really and poor. Eliminated for that competition. He came back briefly and he had a good game. I think particularly it was probably the best game of the season against Motherwell. He played pretty decent. Apart from that, he's been injured or been poor. Considering he's probably on quite a hefty wage, he's probably one of the highest earning players at the club. I think he was probably, for me, the the, the biggest disappointment um, of the season. Yeah, I, don't, I think that's pretty sort of drawn parallels with McCarthy as well, though, when you... Th- Think about the name that they came with. The name versus the return. So, I know it's a strong choice. Liam, actually, no, you always come after Mark. Sorry. Sean, come to you instead. You're muted. Oh, you're muted, Sean. Uh, <laughs> that's the only time that's happened this season. Production value <clears throat> through the floor. I thought I had a present brought in for me, so I didn't want that to be uh, streamed. Um. Yes, I have chose 
Harry McCurdy um, for a lot of the same reasons that, that Craig has. My main reason is you know the the amount of money that we have potentially paid him, whether that be signing fee and weekly wages in comparison to what we've got back. Uh, that's it. No fault of of Harry in regards to what he's tried to do when he's been on the park. Um, he has had a tough run of it to an extent in regards to the amount of times he's maybe played 90 minutes in a row. I think we could probably count on one hand the amount of 90 minute matches he's played. Yeah, so, like yeah. So it's exactly. Oh, I don't. Did he get 90 minutes in the six nil? I know. I was going to say he played 90 against Aberdeen. No, I didn't. I don't think. They get taken off as well. So. He was very good. He was, yeah. he was good in that game. Eh? Um, I don't think so, he started that game. He did. No, he did. He did, he did start. Did he? Uh, Nisbet was. Yeah, because Nisbet was on the bench. Oh no, yeah. I, th- I think he came on, or maybe Josh O'Connor came on for him. because uh, Nisbet was on his holidays to Millwall. Yeah. <laughs> um. I again, it's n- absolutely no criticism of of the person or the personality. Um. I like footballers to have a bit about them. If he was scoring goals and everything like that, everyone would be lapping him up. But. For what he's came, I don't want to class it as baggage, but what he's brought with him, um, and Craig's right in what he said. Everyone was wanting the recruitment team and Ben, their, their heads on spikes. So, yeah, unfortunately, it's Harry McCurdy. But again, I think I think he'll be here next season, and I hope that he, he kicks on, has a good summer, and hopefully has a good season next season. I, w- I wouldn't put it past them to have that. I just want to see the Sally once. I- I just want it. That's all I want. That was like me with Chef Kikuchi. Same thing. <laughs> That's all I wanted to see was the flying fin celebration. Right, Liam, we'll wrap up with you. Your worst signing of the season. Four words. Momo Bojang fucking disaster. <laughs> Is that it? Nothing, yep. nothing to add? I mean, I think... The words speak for themselves, Craig. The thing is, though, Bojan came with absolutely... We all knew he was going to be rank rotten, didn't we? So so why did we sign him then? I don't know. I think it was just a laugh. Wasn't it? I think it was charity. I think it was for charity. <laughs> I will say, I do think that Bojang's Hibs career might have went in a different direction if he'd scored that chance against Kelly. No, mate, he was no. absolutely... Or the chance against Bonnie, like... He was or he post that picture on Facebook, he's digs. <laughs> it's the way that when he's running through against Kelly, you know he's not scoring it, and then when he misses it, like his shock reaction to missing it, like <laughs> uh, he is the worst player I've ever seen. Still have nightmares. I think it was like the see when he was running through it. It seemed to me as if he'd never like played a game of football before. But he took it with his, he took it with his weak foot as well. Like, he went like a, across the goal that way and hit it back across his heel. Yeah, and he took incredible decision. I didn't even get in my seat. I knew, I knew he wasn't the scorer. <laughs> I was pissing myself when he missed it. Like, <clears throat> right, lads, we need to make a decision in the words of democracy. Are we going for Harry McCurdy or purely for the disaster that he was? We go for Momo Bojang. I mean, I'm an advocate for Bojang here. I think McCurdy's fair. You've got to remember, as bad as Bojang was, he was alone and we terminated it. At probably the earliest opportunity. He was probably on about 30 quid a week. <laughs> and three digs. Going by his digs, he, he certainly was on about 30 quid a week, if his digs are to, to be believed. Okay, I'm, so I'm, I, w- I would say that McCurdy is a, a fair choice. And I feel bad saying, oh, he's the worst sign of the season, because I really, I don't think there's been a Hibs player, you know, apart from Chris Mueller, that I've wanted to do well so much. But it and speaks volumes that the players that you desperately want to do well are the ones that desperately do not do well. I can't wait to see where you pin your hopes on next season. <laughs> Harry McCurdy again. And hopefully he's, got, he he's, 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 he's stuck with Josh Campbell and Josh Campbell's came good. So. Sorry, yeah. Harry. It's not all your fault, but democracy dictates Listen, that. if we can see the celebration once next season, then we will automatically give you a moment of the season. Simple no, as. Let's not make promises that we can't keep. I can see him scoring against the first steady team that we play in Europe at Easter Road. I can see him scoring about 15 goals next season. I can see him at Chelsea. Deep, but I could also see him scoring none in 
going to Cheltenham on loan in January. Cheltenham? <laughs> yeah. What, for the races? <laughs> want to play football? <laughs> right. Next up, we'll go for the worst moment of the season. So this can be a game, a moment in a game, anything that happened with the club. Liam, we'll go with you first. What was your worst individual moment of the season? I think it would be tasteless to not mention the passing of Ron. Um, I don't want to nominate that as a look at this. It's the worst moment. But I think the passing of Ron had a, a big impact on everybody at the club. Um, obviously, it was it was tragic, and you know the club has really rallied around the Gordons, um, you know, and, and the CEO and stuff. So it's a uh, that was obviously a, a, a really hurtful moment of the season. But the worst moment of the season for me was uh, Toby Simic's goal at Easter Road, the we think after I'd been screaming at him for the whole that he was a beast. And uh, then he scored and put his fingers in his ears and made me look like a right fucking arsehole. <laughs> Doesn't take much to do that, in fairness. Nope, it does not. Mark, what's your worst moment of the season? <clears throat> I've gone for the final whistle in the last game of the season. Um, I I've honestly don't think I've felt as gutted as I did in that game. I know we didn't get beat, but for me that felt worse than a defeat. I've been at derbies at Tincastle where we've been beat in the past that I can just kind of shake it off. But that one, to be honest, is still haunting me to this day. A little bit of a what if situation. The fact that man, they got a man sent off. We equalised immediately after, and we had something like seventy minutes to break them down and get the winner. And how unbelievable would that have been? And winning at Tincastle to leapfrog Hearts in the last game of the season, it would have been biblical. And we just, we just bottled the chance to do that and to see Hearts celebrating the way they did to see the players celebrating the way they did coming over at the Hibs end it, it stung that one, it really did and that for me is still the the worst moment I of the season believe that Because Hearts don't celebrate draws Yeah, exactly Sean, what about you? Uh, mine is getting knocked out the League Cup Group stages, which consisted of a group of us, Falkirk, Bonnie Rigg, Morton and Clyde. I think <laughs> I shouldn't need to elaborate on this. Um, and I think I'm hoping that this wins it, if I'm, if I'm honest. Considering we finished third in that group for a club the size of Hibs is nothing short of embarrassing. I don't care that Lee Gordon... Uh, Lee Gordon? Jesus. Um... Lee Johnson, who is just in the door. Uh, we started it with, uh, we were 5-0 up against Clyde in the first half in our first game as well. And then what happened after that was just a, a good old-fashioned Hibs disaster class. The game against Falkirk, and then we think we've got it back on, on track against Bonnie Rigg, albeit it took a while and we missed a penalty. And then the whole nonsense that overshadowed the Morton game with Rocky and everything like that for a club <laughs> the size of Hibs to do something like that as well as I mean, that wouldn't have even mattered, we would have been knocked out anyway um, and I think that started off a lot of the, not nastiness that Lee Johnson gets but a lot of, a lot of people were then just not on his side for then on and it just didn't help his case I know we went through a lot of bad periods results wise as a club this season and I think it's just this the start of that goes right back to that League Cup campaign. I think if that's managed better as a club and managed better from a from Lee Johnson, not only could we have went far in the competition, that you know, it just should, it just shouldn't have happened. Yeah. No, I I tend to agree. And I do think it's probably my individual worst moment of the season because uh, Liam decided to tell everyone that uh, I had hassled Derek Rardin for a selfie <laughs> because he was sat right in front of me. Um, I'd pushed his wee laddie out the road. And even though it didn't happen, I couldn't say it didn't happen because then it made it look like it did actually happen. <laughs> it did. So that, I've seen it with my eyes. So that was incredibly embarrassing for me. Um, but yeah, I'll throw my weight behind uh, exiting the League Cup group stages 
Not even due to the administrative error that we ended up suffering <laughs> from. <laughs> Which is because... See when you look back on it, how funny is it? Absolute man? gammon against three lower league sides. I'm going to put my neck on the line and potentially give us a a worst take now for next season. I think that we'll win the League Cup next season. <laughs> you <Okay. bet> all. <laughs> we're in Europe, so we're not in the group stages. So we're already at the quarter, so we've only got a couple of games to win to get to the final. That's true, mm-hmm. I suppose. Yeah. Great. And we're not going to go <laughs> up against Big Flange anymore. Correct. No, it doesn't look like it. Just, just need to whack them all. Whack them I all. think I think this then this needs to go to the League Cup group stages, surely. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. It's a season of optimism was destroyed before the season had actually even started. <laughs> our, our season was in tatters by the middle of July. <laughs> <laughs> could have been worse, it could have been Motherwell. Who <laughs> who sat the manager before the season started. After their two yeah. games against Sligo Rovers, mind that? They do. Right. We'll move on. We'll pick it back up again before we start to to wrap up our funniest moment of the season. Now, again, this could be game related, football related, or anything. Um, I've got three that involve each one of us. So, first one is obviously. Uh, Liam's dance at um, the Tony Macaroni being first hand to that seeing it from the back wishing I'd joined in and never joined in and then seeing it for the front was just it was rent free in my head for about a month even <laughs> now when it comes up I still go back and watch it um, that's where the views are coming from then I always laugh when I see the tweet that goes out saying has anybody got the video of the Hibs fan dancing? Because it's living in my head rent free. Um, next is what features on our first ever um, produced bit of merch, <clears throat> which is the Hibs Ramble uh, mug that um, we have Sean describes in quite intricate detail his preference for a soft rim. Um, and then finally, my other funniest moment is sitting in the bowling club before. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Mark is going to the bar and he asks um, he asks my laddie what flavour of crisps he wants and Liam's dad mishears because he was drinking Iron Brew and thought that he'd asked him what kind of flavour of Iron Brew he liked and <laughs> Liam's dad replied Iron Brew flavour <laughs> <laughs> Which then Mark then went on the defensive, started going for Colin's attire. <laughs> started going for my dad's soup and try something, man. It's because the crystal got it off. <laughs> he does not He really does not Rain shines. So yeah, that's that's my three that I think perfectly encapsulates because it captures a moment from from each of us. Well, apart from me, obviously, because I'm no funny and I'm quite boring. I oh, made a cardboard, didn't you? Yeah. What about yours, Liam? What's your funniest moment? I've got a couple. I think um, Bojang's miss against Kilmarnock is one of them. Because <laughs> I was pissing myself when he missed it. I don't think anyone in the stadium thought he was going to score. And when he missed it, it was kind of like... I was kind of relieved that he did miss it. Because imagine he'd scored and he had to start the next game. That would have been brutal, man. <laughs> uh, next up, I've got... <laughs> making Dave Cormack cry on Sky Sports News Bella, <laughs> after yep, he beat good. them 6-0 and when he came through the Albi and everyone going Way! that was quality because me and Mark were in hospitality that day um, and I didn't even want to say the dance at Livingston but I'm going to have to because it was superb wasn't it yep, millions that's... of views I'm a superstar simple as it's, it's like that John Collins kind of passing the move in the tempo. It's like the timing. Oh, it's just impeccable. Oh, it's, it's rent free. Impeccable. I'll insert a video of it here somewhere on the overlay. Yeah, Mark, what about you? I am going with, in terms of moment, the iron brew flavour. <laughs> um, just 
because of the sheer absurdity of it all. Um, you know, asking Craig's laddie, right, <laughs> what, I went round, right, three Guinnesses and I didn't brew a packet of crisps, right, no bother, what flavour do you want? For Colin, no no hesitation <laughs> to turn around and say, I didn't brew flavour. Not, <laughs> not even considering the fact that it was obviously me talking to Craig's laddie about what, what flavour <laughs> was. So that, that was a hilarious moment. Also, I want to give a special mention to the overall day where we had hospitality um, at Easter Road for the Aberdeen. More pester than the, the padded seat guy. Yeah, I, I just everything about that day was just absolutely comical. And the fact that we were all sitting at the table with about eight drinks each at one point, um, just a brilliant day, hilarious day all around. And the result was brilliant. So, there you go. Sean? I know we're trying to keep this hib specific, but... I can't not mention, and this is the funniest moment for me, because I wasn't there for the Iron Brew moment, the three old Hearts fans outside Tyne Castle <laughs> claiming that Bobby Nielsen is going to break the old forum and lead Hearts to the league title. I think it was before 2025 or something like that, yeah. um, only for Nielsen to get sacked a couple months later and <laughs> for them to tail off abysmally. So, yes, that is my funniest moment of the season. Get it up, by the way. Get it <clears throat> right up, them. Honourable mention to um, Kane and his McPlant. Yeah. That was just... That was hilarious. Would you like to give context, Craig, for any of our newer listeners that didn't take part? Yes. Yeah, so, as we discussed, <laughs> uh, the January transfer window, we'd done a, we'd done a space, me and Liam. Um, I don't think you were on it, Sean, or I think you might have dipped in and out. Yeah, I was, yeah. I only did it for the last hour because it, it was like half because 12 like, and we still didn't have Harry McCurdy. I was like, I'm going to bed. Um, and we were sort of discussing food and scran. Um, and Kane, a listener to the Hibs Ramble, said that he had tried a McPlant, which we were all right. For, wouldn't it be me? No, for me. He then revealed that he'd actually. <laughs> <laughs> He then revealed that he'd actually shared the McPlan. <laughs> they passed it about like a joint and taken bites of it each. While they were still in McDonald's. <laughs> Aye, Imagine all... being an onlooker on that situation. It would be incredible. Then what yeah. I liked most about that, right, is he had left, he was listening to the space while he was at his missus' house. He was ignoring her to listen to the space. <laughs> then gets a row from her Patches her, drives home, shares a story with us, only for him to continually be slated six months later. <laughs> He's got his, his Twitter bio as well. I came across his uh, Twitter the other day. He was like, shared a McPlant once. Uh, his what bio. a guy. Incredible stuff. Yeah, that was good. Um, I think for... Given the fact that Sean wasn't there for the Iron Brew moment, I think it would be harsh to give it that. I think we should go for, for Liam's dance. I'll take it. Aye, fair. Because of the level of interest it generated and the views it got, and the he made it onto the Scottish football Instagram page. And that's kind of a who's who of a um, mecca. Yeah, a mecca, a mecca path for, And he's doing well to keep his head in the frame at the moment. Cheers, mate. I'm just leaning back. And yeah. I'm aware I'm going to get cut off with the overlay, so I need to. So, I want my beautiful head. Well done, Liam. Thanks very much. I, I really appreciate it. However, I do believe that if Sean had been present, the Iron Brew flavour would have ran away with it. Oh, Quite a million percent. It was hilarious. Because that was absolutely sensational. So it shout so out, funny. Colin. Shout out, Colin. Uh, you've been a great contributor to the Ramble <laughs> Cross season and you've provided one of the most memorable moments of the season as well. <laughs> what a hero, man. What a hero. And can I just say, me and Colin are going on our European tour as well. Because Liam is blood. So it's just yeah. me and Liam's father. Incredible stuff. <laughs> the that, son that he wanted. Mark Duncan. That has potential to be the best vlog that's ever existed on the internet. Imagine. Mark Duncan. Dad, we're we're drinking uh, Iron Brew in Bratislava or something. Mark, we're in the Francis Bourgeois GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, man. Him and Colin have a late night kiss in a Macedonian bed set. 
That would be some. That would be some vlog. That. <laughs> I'll be wanting to tell the grandkids, man. Uh, right. So finally, we've got season-defining moments. No, <clears> we've got limbs as well. You missed yep. limbs. Oh, sorry, limbs of the season. Yep, my bad. We've got limbs of the season. Um, right, Liam, we'll come to you first. What is your limbs of the season? Uh, Nisbet at Ibrox. There was a couple that it could have been, but Nisbet at Ibrox is the one for me. Uh, they just scored, and then obviously we went up the park, and about 15 seconds later, we stuck one right in their goal hole. And uh, I fell down about three rows. Mark had to pull me out of the, out of the carnage. I got assaulted by a police officer. Um, not that I will press charges, but um, sounds common. Yeah. I broke that. It was uh, it was incredible limbs, and it was probably, I think, uh, maybe apart from the the cup final winner, it's maybe the most I've ever celebrated a goal. Maybe I don't know. I broke I broke limbs are good limbs. I broke limbs are great limbs, and we were right next to the Rangers fans as well. Because obviously they were getting us at tight for equalising, and then to just run right up the park, and I don't, none of them were even looking at the park. They were too busy looking at us, and I don't. They never do look at the park, though. I don't think half of them realised that we'd actually scored. No, they don't. They never do look at the pitch. It's like the weirdos in the section G and section N at Tyne Castle. They yeah. watch the road burn. So Rangers away, uh, Mark. What's yours? Yeah, absolutely no doubt in my mind that's the Nisbet goal at Ibrox. Not even close in my opinion. The first the Porteous goal in that game was absolute pandemonium, but like uh, McClendo said, they equalised, their fans are going mental, spilling over the barrier to get to us. And then literally seconds later, if you watch the Sky Sports replay, it's still cutting back to the game. That's how quick it was. Nisbet fires one in and it was it was honestly I I agree with Liam, it's it, I've can't remember a game where I've looked around me and just seen that much carnage. It was just bodies, eh? Just I bodies guess. flying about. Just bo- like flying about everywhere. McClendo was looking up at the sky, facing me was like a f- baby, like that. <laughs> I had to pick him up. The, it was just madness, and it was fantastic. Um, I, police were pushing us down the stairs. The Rangers fans were spitting at us. It, it was just it was pure magic. Sean. I'm glad we've lost that game because oh. imagine, imagine we'd have won that game. Eh? That would be class. Yeah, I remember the the Slivka limbs. Those were they were potentially the best away limbs I've ever experienced. Yeah, that was because I came on the back of a win as well. Yeah, and it was the first time we played them after the the cup final as well. Yep. But Sean, what's yours? What's your limbs of the season? Mine's is uh, Kevin Nisbet's free kick away to Hearts last game of the season. I didn't actually want to pick it just because it was a draw and like Mark, I'm I'm still a bit annoyed about the game. It feels like a bit of a loss, but the fact that <clears throat> we thought it was a penalty, so we were celebrating the penalty, then goes to VAR red card, so you're then celebrating that. There was then, for me anyway, just an expectation that it was going to go in anyway, regardless of the fact it was a free kick. Um, I've had some very, very good limbs at Tyne Castle, uh, normally down the front. But for me, that was the best away limbs that I've experienced. I know it was limbs in general, um, but for me, the best away limbs this, this season. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I think because I took the the boys as well and they went in the march, it made it a wee bit, a wee bit more... A wee bit more special. Um, so we're we're tied, and I think we'll need to give the decider to to Liam and Mark because they experience both. I just can't bring myself to give anything to that game because of the outcome of it. Um, so you're picking the limbs from a defeat. No, yeah. <laughs> no, I know, I know, but I just think the the. the nah, I know, I know what you mean. I completely get it. More, but my limbs, my limbs experience for that game against Hearts was. It was obviously limbs, it was obviously class, but I was front row, and we spoke about this the last time, I was front row, and in the row below me, like, like they, they like cordoned off the, like the bottom row, and the row below me, it was like chicken wire, and then it was like the barrier, and then the pitch. So, I mean, if I'd have went mental, I would have went, I would have fallen onto the park, and I would have been flung out. So, it wasn't that I had to like subdue my limbs, 
But I just had to be like, like cautious because I was like, if I if I like lose my foot in here, then I'm I'm going to hurt myself. And I didn't want to hurt myself. Absolutely I not. I felt like that St Johnston first game of the season because I was in the front row. It's kind of no limbs if you've got nobody in front of you. If you go, I no, I, I think I think that's that's a good point. But I think I was I would still go for Nisbet at Ibrox. It was genuinely. I don't. I don't think I've ex- I've experienced limbs like that maybe three, four times in my life, and that was one of them. And I can't say the feet, but it was I'm happy great. to uh, Craig. I'm happy to support it, and I'm sure you will be knowing how good limbs are at Ibrox when you take the lead. So, albeit the outcome of the match was a defeat, the fact that that goal was to take the lead, I think if I was if I was at Ibrox that night, that day most likely would have been my limbs. And I think yeah. for Hearts as well, it wasn't. I didn't feel it to be limbs as such. It was more relief. It was like more of a a, a real cheer than <laughs> just going like because the other man said, "Oh, I thought it was a penalty." Then we score from the free kick. Of course, it was like kind of like limbs. But for me, it was more a relief. We're back in the game. Let's go and do it. If we had went on to get the second goal, then it's a completely different story. But Aye, I'm going to stick with this bit. The fact that the, the thing, thing is, the game didn't, expect to, didn't, expect to go, didn't expect to go one nil up at Ibrox, never mind 2-1 up. Mm-hmm. So soon after they've scored. Whereas at Tynecastle, you're always kind of expecting a goal. So I think that Ibrox one holds more weight for me. Even though it was a defeat and even though it didn't mean as much. I think that Ibrox one definitely. That's fine. Well, well done, Kevin. You provided Mark and Liam with their limbs of the season. You provided me and Sean with our limbs of the season. Um, Honourable mention for Josh Campbell's penalty at Parkhead. That was pretty good. Um, oh, yeah. Only because I was right on the, you know, that steel barrier of red and white police ticker tape that was um, holding me back from getting to the Probably the most tepid Celtic fans I've ever seen in my life. I um, thought it was an equaliser. That's how bevy I was at half time. I thought the game was one one. <laughs> McLean was like, "Ah, we're one nil up." <laughs> oh, no, it's one one. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, aye, so special mentions to that and Ellie Yuan's goal at St Mirren. That was a pretty, pretty decent. I missed, I missed that. I was at the toilet and I heard them. the cheer and I like I sprinted back to the toilet. And everyone was going mental because I thought it was a St. Mungo. Everyone was going mental. You still had your cock in your hand. I was fuming as well because I was like, I can't exactly go mental here because I haven't seen it. And like, like the celebrations were tailing off. So I couldn't come out and go, fucking yes! And they've seen it. So I feel like we were away as well. We had, uh, there was a good set of limbs at Levy Away, considering it was Levy Away. The same thing goes for. For being in the front row there, me and Craig were in the front row, so it was wasn't as good limbs. I think because we were right next to block seven and there was that sort of the, the walkway that we kind of jumped down onto um and got involved, it was pretty decent. But I well done, Kevin. You've provided all of us with our limbs of the season, but Rangers just steadies it. So <clears throat> to wrap up, we've got three season defining moments now whether that's a partic- again a particular game a particular incident I'll give my three to start so my first one is the introduction of VAR now I know there's got a couple of the boys have maybe got a particular instance contained within this which is why I went overall for VAR but there's been moments during the season that we have been victim of shite decisions that with VAR in place we would have got example Miko's goal up at Tanadice um, that no one can still say and then on the flip side um, you've got instances like JR against St Johnston in the last minute and Mel Chris in a way to Kilmarnock being given offside when it's sh- without VAR, it probably would have been onside. I count Jay eight wrong decisions with and without yeah. VAR. There's eight match defining decisions that we had against us this season. Yeah. Jago's red card away at McDermott Park, Duke's dive up in Aberdeen, Ross County <clears throat> assault on Marshall. Yeah. 
So for me, a big, big part of the season has been VAR and the fact that we have been victim to so many shite decisions and not really had many contentious ones go our way. Um, the only one you could probably say big one recently was uh, Cochrane getting sent off because there's and an argument. Penalty at Pitodre. There's no, because it was a handball. I know, but I wouldn't have given it. No, but what, know you know how you get like Jago's one when you go and check it, you can give a you, you can kind of oh, argue. Oh, right, no, I know what you mean now. Like when it comes to the contentious ones, we've not really had the benefit of them. No. Um, my second season defining moment is Ryan Porteous finally leaving. And I think we spoke about it at the time when he did leave because I just felt it was constantly casting a shadow over the club. Um, and that it inadvertently became the Ryan Porteous show at times. You know, he was an automatic first pick. Now, if he'd have left in the summer and Will Fisher had played at the back all season, would be, again... It's if your granny had wheels, she would have been a bike type power. But group stage European football, basically. Yep. Potentially. Um and then finally my last one is we've already covered it with Sean, and that's the League Cup. I think that really set the tone for the especially the supports attitude towards Johnson for the for the rest of the season after that. So yeah, that's this isn't really an award as such, just more th- three areas where we think the season was sort of kind of won and lost. Um, mostly minds are all losses, though, to be fair. Um, Mark, what's yours? Um, I've gone with the 3-0 defeat to Hearts at Easter Road. Um, I think that was probably, uh, I'm sure everyone would agree, the lowest point of the season. Um, I think that was the point where Johnson had the most amount of pressure given the fact they had just come off another 3-0 defeat to Hearts at Tynecastle. <clears throat> Not only had he been eliminated from the League Cup, but now the Scottish Cup, their biggest rivals, 3-0 back-to-back, so on and so forth. Um, I think that was a real, real low point, and I, I don't think, or I think a lot of us thought that Johnson wasn't going to make it through that. I think we'd even said on maybe on this podcast that at the start of that month, would say this is a season-defining month because if Lee Johnson loses both derbies back-to-back, then that could very well be the end of his his spell because that's exactly what happened to Sean Maloney to, to lose his job. Um, then only a week later, I've got us beating Aberdeen 6-0. Um, I think that defined the season because we knew then that we were going to keep Johnson. We, we had a little bit of... Um, this is what we can do um, and I think that maybe got a little bit of confidence back in us it also triggered Aberdeen to get rid of Jim Goodwin and then get Barry Robson in which then obviously led to them going on an incredible run and finishing third so that was a, a defining moment and then lastly I have got us being all quite late in the season but I've got us beating Hearts 1-0 at Easter Road uh, the reason I put that is because I felt that was the game where we really felt that we could go and challenge in the top six. Probably the best um, top six. Like, that that took us into the, the top six known we'd beat Hearts. We still had to play them at Tynecastle. We still had, obviously, the old firm. And we went on to have probably one of the best top six campaigns I can remember. You know, we, we were only beaten once to Rangers. We beat Celtic. We beat St Mirren. We should beat Hearts, albeit we, we only got a point. And I feel the catapult into that form in the top six was beating Hearts at, at Tynecastle. Um, when you look at the top six, we really should have beat Aberdeen. That penalty, you know, that you could even say that was a season-defining moment. Should have yep. really beat Hearts. We beat Celtic, we beat St Mirren. So when you look at that, we could have easily won five games out of six. I know we didn't, and like Craig said, you know, if your grand had wheels, you would have been a bike and all that. But you know, I think that would have propelled us. Uh, that that win against Hearts really propelled us to, to have that sort of form, and we could easily win five out of six. Four yeah. out of five. Four out of five. That's what it say, yeah. No, you're you're right, and given that many folk had written us off without to not even getting a point, the fact that we came out of it with one defeat, two wins and two draws, and really, like you say, could have been four wins. Um, obviously apart for the sort of disaster against Rangers at Easter Road. Um, Sean, what's yours? 
Um, <clears throat> mine's are kind of similar to Mark. I obviously had the 6-0 win to Aberdeen, but we're, we're wanting to keep it kind of Hibs directly influenced. Um, although it obviously was a pivotal moment in the season, we obviously didn't have any control over the fact that what Aberdeen would then go on to do. So kind of keeping it directly Hibs related, mine's is uh, Kukarevic, the first one, Kukarevic's goal getting um, called as offside away at Dundee United and the 1-0 defeat just before VAR, the fact that Okay, you touched on it, the fact that VAR <clears throat> either has or hasn't helped us throughout the season in different instances is, is ridiculous because we should it sh- there should be a level of consistency. But for the fact that it would have counted in that match, because obviously it was an offside, so they would have been able to draw the lines and hopefully come to the conclusion that it should have been on. Um, I say hopefully because of the Melkerson offside at Kelly. The fact that we then lost that match and then went on a losing run. We lost nine out of the next 11 matches, um, only winning the the other two. That kind of just, again, because of what happened with the League Cup situation, just put a lot of people's, it just put Lee Johnson's head on the the firing ram, so to speak, and wanted them gone. And Some still haven't really recovered from that. And I think if the way that we were dominating that match at Dundee United, if that had counted, I have no absolutely 100% back in that we would have went on to win the match. The second defining moment for me was the, the sad passing of, of Ron Gordon. I touched on it with, I think it was with you, Craig, not long after it happened, where um, you were talking about how the club seems to be coming together and how everyone seems to be supporting each other and what else could have brought that on because the results haven't necessarily been the greatest throughout the season. And obviously everything's a lot more important than, than football with it. football just being a game and, and everything that comes with that. But the scenes before, well, the scenes at the Levy game to start with the fans and the backing that they had of the team, then the scenes at Easter Road at the Rangers game before the match, albeit the result obviously wasn't what we wanted, it just showed that I think it showed the players and the staff that maybe hadn't experienced that level of support before what Hibs is and what Hibs can potentially be. Unfortunately, Ron never got to experience, obviously, Sunshine and Leaf getting barely down at Easter Road, but we've certainly gave it a good couple of goes um, in his passing um, for his memory as well. Mm. And I think the overall passing of him, which is incredibly sad, is... A defining part of our season because it's brought the club together not necessarily the fans in the club but I'm talking about the players the individuals the egos have put all that aside and they've been able to rally behind each other and just push on throughout the whole season and yes we've only ended up finishing fifth but we've got into Europe and I think there'll be a right push next season um, to continue Ron's legacy. Yep. The third and final one for me was, and it links into obviously what I've just spoke about, was, was Nisbet's goal in the, the Derby win at Easter Road. Um, not only was that goal just a sense of relief because we dominated the match from start to finish, but I think it gave the the players a real sense of confidence and reassurance in what Ron got uh, or in what Lee got. Oh, done it again. What Lee Johnson. It's <laughs> because uh, Ron Gordon's on my screen as well, being behind me. Um, it gave the players a real understanding of what Lee Johnson is trying to do Um, and it gave the support a real reassurance that we're heading in the right direction and I feel like after that uh, after that win at Easter Road against Hearts a lot of the doubters in Lee Johnson have kind of slowly started to turn and then obviously what Mark's already touched on we went on to have a really good split as well and I don't think that would have been possible if we didn't put in that level of performance against Hearts in that victory. Um, I think the fact that we got the win instead of it being a draw allowed us to kind of push on and do what we've done in the, the closing end of the season. It's a strong three, Sean. And I think we echo everything that you said about, about Ron as well. Um, right, Liam, <clears throat> we'll leave it up to you to to send us home your your three defining moments of the season. Listen, I'm not too sure if these are in chronological order because <clears throat> I can't remember what came first. Um, usually my you. first one, eh? Usually me, and no, that's not usually me. It's always me. <laughs> it's only me. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> You've thrown me off now. Uh, my first one is the is the disallowed goal from Kukarevic at Tanadice because we had just come off the back of a really, really good run that we'd put together. And I think, like Sean said, if, if that had gone in, we would have won the game. And chances are we probably <clears throat> we probably would have went on and won another few games on the back of it. Uh, and then, you know, if that happens, then, you know, we're sitting doing this podcast talking about group stage European football next season. Uh, but it didn't. And I think that is... See, just before you go into your other ones, I think it's probably one of the biggest defining things is that the fact that the team that got relegated, we never took three points off them once. Just because yeah. you're talking about the disallowed goal at Tanadice, like that's probably a big, big factor as well. And the fact that we only did finish fifth is that the team that went down, we didn't beat them once. Mm-hmm. Exactly. My next one is the signing of Jimmy Jago. I feel like <laughs> I'm... <laughs> No, I'm not taking the piss in, and I honestly think that his signing has allowed players like Joe Newell, uh, now Jake Doyle Hayes, um, Josh Campbell to really push forward and play their game. Um, I think he's been a really important signing. He's not a glamour player. He's not someone who's going to stick one in the top bag from 30, 40 yards out. He uh, he he does his job. He does it well. And uh, he's he's allowed, you know, Joe Newell probably to win Player of the Season. Uh, well, not not our Player of the Season, but he's he's allowed Joe Newell to win the Hibs Player of the Season, the one that nobody cares about. Uh, but no, I think that's been a a real defining moment in our season because it's then allowed our midfield to push on and perform better than they were in those games. We're, we're on that really long, on uh, that really long, winless run, um, and I think he's been at least a, at least a fairly big part of that. Finally, I'm going to go for six 0 against Aberdeen because I think it's the game that kicked El Yuan on. Um, it was a, a huge game for not only the fact that it was against Aberdeen, but for Lee Johnson. You know, when it comes to what was on the line for him, whether he would have been sacked or not, if if we got beat, we'll never know. But um, no, it's it, it was obviously a, a good a good result. But I think in the grand scheme of things, and in the the you know the the context of where we were in that moment, it was a really really big moment, and I, I, it certainly allowed me to to kind of come together again with the club and have that connection that was lost you know during the early parts of the season and I feel like we finished the season on a high ish you know after after that and I think everyone's sort of kind of rallying behind the team after that game because like you said Sean it, it showed what we could do yeah and I think the fact that like Mark said that Dave Cormack was on national radio and national telly crying his eyes out um, like they can they can gloat about being in the group stages next season all they want but um, their owner was literally in tears on telly and radio um, so no I think a strong <clears throat> I think what we've probably found that over the last couple of hours is that it's been a very much a season of ups and downs but there's definite signs there um, that with the right back and especially with Brian McDermott in the summer window, if we can maybe get somebody like Will Fish back to settle the defence, the, the big challenge will be, of course, replacing Nisbet when he goes. But <clears throat> we've got the money there. We've now got the people and pl- we've got right people in the right areas at the club that <clears throat> I here's hoping that next season's awards were absolutely battering each other for our choices. Well, we might actually be presenting the Player of the Year awards next season yeah, at Hibs. And instead of it being the Hibs Player of the Year, it will just be everyone pays 200 quid to come and watch us reprobates give our opinions. 
Yeah, that was we're not supposed to talk about that just yet, remember. Oh Lee Johnson did tell me not to talk about that. Yeah. So no, that'll wrap up season one of the Hibs Ramble. It's what been season, boys. What a season. I know we got a bit of grief for backslapping last week, but so what? We've done incredibly well. And I think we deserve to backslap each other a wee bit. So yeah, thanks to everybody who's listened over the course of the season, anybody who's liked the tweet, shared the tweet, responded to a tweet, asked us a question, especially John, for your oh, dinners. Actually, in the spirit of John, what are you actually having for your dinner tonight? Uh, I had a mince round. A bell's I... mince round, tinned tatties and beans, and it was incredible. Tinned tatties? Yeah, didn't knock it till you've tried it. I had uh, a piri piri stuffed pepper with chips. A piri piri stuffed pepper with chips? That actually sounds really good. Uh, it wasn't that great. Oh, really? Nah. What was the pepper stuffed with? Rice? Uh, lentils. Oh. Yeah. You've let your shell down. We move on. It wasn't me that made it. We move You've on. You've let your shell down. I've, I've texted Mark because he's dropped off to have his tea what he's having I don't think he's going to get back to me in time but well, Megan have... well Megan made us a tomato pasta baked with smoked sausage for it. and it was unreal and Hunter's a cheese it was great it was absolutely great maybe for next season we're going to have to review pasta dishes well I mean the, the amount that Sean eats pasta I eat pasta quite a lot as well to be fair Sean, you are like a pasta fiend. Can I? Yeah. What's your favourite kind of pasta, like shape? Um, I like rigatoni, you know. Oh, I tell you what, that's my, that's my favourite. Apart from spaghetti, rigatoni is my favourite. I feel like spaghetti isn't like a... It's a proper pasta, but it tastes different. I like linguine as well. Linguine's, linguine's up there. Linguine's all right. Spaghetti well, tastes different. You like spaghetti, than you like linguine, surely. No, I do like linguine, but no, it doesn't play in the same league as spaghetti for me. I'm very much a fusilli or a penny kind of guy. Oh, you're not a fusilli kind of fusilli guy. Fusilli is top. I, 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 I'm with Craig on that one. It's up there. Really? Yeah. It's up there 100 But If it's cooked correctly, it's it's up there 100%. Well, we've got we've got a reply. We've been waffling that much. We've got a reply from Mark. He's having halloumi, chicken and rice and pita bread. One of Mark's better ones. That is yep. one of Mark's better ones. It's better than it's an Aldi chicken sauce stroll, that's for sure. And it sure is. It sure <clears> is. Yep. So again, thanks to everybody who's listened, and thanks especially as well to Starna for their exquisite lease of a merch. Um, pre-orders are still open. Liam, how long? Much longer are the pre-orders You've open for? You've got until the sixteenth of June to get your so pre-orders eight. in for our European tour, baby. Our first batch has already been sent to production, so we'll hopefully have a few of those out in the next few weeks. Um, so the hibramble.com, knock yourselves a bucket hat, t-shirt, jacket, get all three if you like. So I, we are going to take a break for a few weeks, um, unless something major happens. Um, we'll probably come back for maybe the fixture announcement when that comes out. We'll see. Um, but from me, from Liam, and from Sean, it's good night from us, and it's good night from him. Thanks for listening, folks. We'll see you next season. See you, bye, lads. Yeah.